pay for other things, pay for marketing and all that good stuff. So okay. those are our two main goals. And you're achieving your goals. Yeah. And you're killing it. I am. Okay, what I like to hear. Susan, what about you? Goals in 2018 and how are you holding yourself accountable? Uh, 2018, we really restructured, you know, I for about 16 years we've tried it different ways. Uh, and this time I it was really important for me to do company culture and really creating more of a team approach. So we actually switch things to where I have a senior designer and a junior designer that partner up on every project. So I assign two people and then we work a little bit more collaboratively. So it's a little bit more um, really working on company culture, managing people just sucks. I mean, I'll just be honest. <laughs> yeah, that was another I, thing I was going to ask because I, tell us how many employees you have. Um, I have five employees and then I work with my husband also, which is a whole other dynamic. <laughs> I have to say that uh, company culture has been super important to me, building an efficient team that we all work together collaboratively, and then also having senior designers that I can trust to go out and execute design ideas and still having my finger on the pulse. So. Okay, awesome. Apologizing in for the train, you guys can hold the mics but you close to your okay. mouth and you hold it down here. Okay, like that. So. We got it. We got it. We'll make out with the microphones. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, so, Brian, what are some of the pain points? I know everybody in the audience has a lot of pain points, and that's probably why you're here tonight, because you want to hear that everybody's in the same boat as you. You're not alone. But what are some of the pain points you face when managing your own business? Client dilemmas, time management, my favorite topic. Accounting, my other favorite topic. And what steps do you take to remedy these issues? Oh, God, that's so much um <laughs> we want to hear that's you're dishing your secrets wait, so tell give us. me one and then i'll i'll start from there okay start with time management time so management. uh gosh you know being responsible i have hope and then i have erin that uh she's working remotely currently but i think managing my time communicating to them what we need to do is probably the biggest thing um and trying to just, as you were talking about, get a team that's cohesive and can talk to each other and make sure we're doing our time billing appropriately. I think we, we really go off of time billing, so um, making sure that we're tracking our hours and starting in time, our time running. Tracking running. your time, yeah. Um, that's a huge one. Uh, client dilemmas. I think you oh, touched on that dilemmas. a little bit, but just to yeah, talk about I think, communication. I think the communication between you and your client is probably the biggest thing. Uh, educating your client on what the process is, because a lot of them don't know. A lot of them, this is their first time hiring an interior designer, and a lot of them feel like they're in the dark about stuff that we do. They don't get it. So even uh, now, I'm just telling them, this is the process. This is what we do. This is what. Uh, do, you, do you have that? Do you have a protocol for that? Do you have a welcome packet or anything in writing that you present to your clients? No. Ooh. I know. Okay. We're working on that. So that. that's another one of our goals. Susan can help you with that too. She has a really beautiful one. Uh, so that's like, that's one of our things that we're working on okay. towards this year as well. Okay, awesome. And Susan, what about you? What I know you've been in business for a long time, but I'm sure you still hit some bumps in the road. So what are your biggest pain points that you're facing when you're managing your business, client dilemmas, time management, and how do you remedy these issues? Clients are my biggest pain points. <laughs> Does everybody else have that problem too? No. No, no I do. I love my clients. I really do. Um, no, I think, you know, I, I kind of geek out on systems, and so as you know, I'm very, very system oriented, and so I have a lot of procedures, and this is how this happens, and this is step one, step two, step three, and so we combine IV with a project management system called Basecamp, and I use those two really in conjunction um, to manage our, so I, I'm out of email completely, like I don't do email communications at all, I do everything with client share folders and everything's on a portal and everything is, um, all my team members that need to be on those files are on those files. So when I say, hey Jillian, can you send her a quote for that, you know, my, or, you know, my junior will send you a quote for those whatever, and then she sees that and she does it. And I don't have to send a separate email to tell her to go do that. Um, 
and then we put the dashboard link to IB in their client share folders, they can access their account at any time, which is a huge time saver. If they have a question, they're not emailing me, asking me, they already have access to that. Um, same as him, you know, uh, cash flow retainers has just pretty much changed our business over the last two years um, because we're always ahead of it. We take retainers on everything. And I, I work a little differently in that I don't work hourly as much. I do design fees plus hourly. I do kind of a hybrid. I do design fees, uh, markups, and hourly. So I kind of combine all three as much as I can. And um, so it's a little bit different, but I'm very, very systems oriented and I've worked really hard to try to get a system in place uh, with our team so that everybody knows kind of what their role is and what they're supposed to do. So, um, you know, we have a ton of expectation documents that we preload all of their base camp files with. This is what to expect when you're getting new floors or new paint or any of, of those. And sort of are things. these documents branded in your yes. branding and they look really professional? Yes. yes. Okay. And so they're available for download. That's amazing. So yeah. definitely, I, I, that's amazing that you're doing that. I think that a big piece here that a lot of designers, are, they go into the project, and I know I was, I did this, I failed at this. Um, we didn't explain the process to our client. And I think that having these documents and spending the time formulating them with Susan, I know, because we've talked about this multiple times, it sets up the client's expectations and they understand and they know when they're going to hear from you and that makes them nervous, right? When they don't hear from you, they feel out of control. So being on top of it, it sounds like both of you have that communication piece down. It, it does. Well, you know, my background is obvious. I mean, I have a degree in psychology. I don't have a degree in design. So <laughs> uh, I, I've done a lot of savvy counseling over the years. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I do believe psychologically that the more prepared you can, um, your clients are, then the easier the process is going to be for you. So every time there's a problem, every time there's a hiccup, it's really an opportunity to refine your process um, on some level because a small percentage will be maybe some unreasonable clients, but the large percentage is, is because those expectations weren't set up front with your clients and what to expect. And so when they're upset about something, to get into their head and see it from their perspective of what they're looking for. If you're trying to mitigate that and your role is to make that process fun and to make it easy because design should be fun and it should be a, a, a really cool thing. So anything you can do to streamline that process. And so on the back end, by using systems that are consistent and cohesive and the same every time, that sets you up for success because you're feeling professional, you're feeling like you have a system in place for this and you're not caught off guard trying to react to something because you already have that expectation set. So it really is about um, having an efficient system, really, at the end of the day. Got it. One last question for you in that. Can you just clarify for us, when you go meet with your client, you leave them with a welcome packet, and what exactly is in your welcome packet? I don't leave them with a welcome you don't, packet. Okay. No. So, when, so my process starts with a consultation. Uh, we do a paid consultation. We go out for up to about an hour. We assess the design needs. Do you charge for that consultation? We do. Okay. Um, How much? Two fifty. Okay. Um, it lasts about forty-five minutes or so, okay. typically. Um, then what we'll do is let them know that we're going to send them a proposal through IV, typically of a design fee that is for the different spaces, and then our service agreement. Um, and we'll send that over, and then we'll take a retainer for hours, about five to ten hours, and then we'll take a retainer 100% on the design fee okay. to design up their space. And then we get them set up in our base camp file, which is a client share. And that's where all their welcome documents are. So we have a welcome sheet. We have a what to expect um, for your budget expectations, what to expect for communication, like don't text me at 10 o'clock at night. Love that. And if you have an emergency, like maybe you can text me. Um, but don't text my team because I'm a, I, I really cracked down this year on like, I don't want my team members working after 4.30. When they come in at 8.30, they leave at 4.30, that's it. Like, I don't want them getting emails and responding late at night. We have to have that downtime or you're going to burn out. And I burn people out. So I, you know, as being self-employed, I can do that, but that's my choice. For my employees, I don't want that to be um, a, an option. I want them to have that time. So, you know, those are the things that, you know, go into that welcome packet of what to expect along with a copy of their service agreement and their link to their IB portal. Awesome. Great. Thank you for sharing. 
So let's talk a little bit, not that we haven't already been talking about it, but creating this profitable business model. So communication, efficiencies, expectations. But let's talk about the actual like money and the nitty gritty. So is markup, or as I like to say, purchase fee, dead? Are you transparent about this? And how do you speak to your clients about this? I know this is a hot topic from a lot of designers these days because we have .com, we have basic pricing everywhere. It's just a big mess. So how do you deal with it, Brian? So I, I deal with it a few ways. So I, my, I don't have a set thing that I do. I don't mark up 20% or it's not in the contract. For some it is, it just really depends on the client in our initial meeting. So some clients will say, hey, I want your designer pricing, that's the only way I'm going to hire you, but I know that it's going to be a big project and we can make it on the hourly end. And in that situation, I'll say, okay, you get the designer discount. In the early days, that's all I did, and that's how I think I made it in the early days, but that's changing. And now we are doing a markup. The thing about markup, it's a little tricky for, for me because I feel like, you know, if you're purchasing it from us, we're kind of a store at the same time that we're an interior design firm. So I don't really go into it. I just say, uh, you know, we will, get you the best price possible, and uh, it's up to you to accept the proposal. Uh, and we always do come in lower than what they can find online. Um, I think that's really uh, the way we're moving forward. It's Have just, you ever had clients shop you and say, oh, I found this at a lower price? No, no, no okay. because we'll either- You're doing the right thing. You're yeah. not working with those clients that are gonna nickel and dime you. Yeah, and honestly, like, if there's something that I absolutely love, and I know it is way beyond the budget, and we cannot, they won't go for it. I will give them our, our wholesale price or our designer price because I want to see it in the project. So I make sacrifices and there's no set markup. And, and plus every vendor is different, you know, so. 100%. And Susan, what about you? Uh -oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mark up everything. So. Or try to purchase fee, it sounds so much nicer than markup. Uh, well, I don't even explain it that way. So, you know, the analogy that all of you will hear is that you go into the grocery store and you buy a gallon of milk and you don't go to the manager and say, what was your cost on this? And did you, was your cost better on this over here? I mean, we all kind of look at pricing and we'd be naive to think that consumers aren't also, and we live in this internet age. So back in the day when my grandmother was a designer up in orange county the only way to get product was to go to the design centers that were exclusive to design trade back in the day and the even the, the showrooms up there wouldn't disclose the pricing in front of your client they would slip you a little note or um, a little something in an envelope that had your price on it and it was up to the designer to put whatever fee they did on top of that product Nowadays, with the internet, everything is so competitive because we're e-commerce, and so you have the guy in his garage that opened an account that can sell a product with no overhead. And so brick and mortars are going away because brick and mortars can't afford to compete with e-commerce. As designers, you really, in my opinion, we are e-commerce providers, uh, but we still have overhead. And if you aren't reselling that. Reselling is a privilege, okay? So manufacturers are looking to all of you designers as outside salespeople. They, you are their sales reps. They want to make sure you're educated on the product, you know the product, and you're gonna go back out and resell that product. And that product that you're marking up or that you're reselling for them should come at a profit for your business because this is your business. And if you wanna, stay educated and have those product knowledge meetings with your reps, then you're gonna be marking up your product very similar to what they would do online. Because when that person has a, a damaged product come in, when the wrong color comes in, who's dealing with it? You are. You are the one that's contacting the rep and processing those returns, and that has a cost. And that goes back into really realizing all of your costs that are involved in running your business. That is overhead. And so the average overhead for interior design businesses is about 15 to 20%. And if you're not making more than that, 
or you're only you know, doing a 15 to 20% markup on your cost, you are just barely breaking even for your time. Because if you're gonna be successful, unless you're in a higher echelon of hourly, you will make more money, on, I will make more money on a sofa than I will selling that sofa. I can make $1,200 selling that sofa for an hour of my time to talk them into buying that sofa. So when you, it, as my uh, juniors like to say, it's a math equation. It's, um, I say this all the time, it's math. You have to look at your numbers. So I do markups, I do design fees for my initial, I've been doing this a long time. I can design your living room in about an hour. I'm not gonna charge them an hour because that hour is cumulative time that I've spent the last 16 years traveling, looking at spaces, going to shows, looking at design places. I have a fee that I will charge you to conceptually come up with your plan and then I will charge you hourly to meet with you and review that with you. And then any revisions, if you wanna see five other options, I'm gonna charge you hourly because that's my time to go back and revise that. But typically, um, you know, we will charge all three different ways. I will come in a little below online pricing and the way I couch it to my clients when I'm talking in initial consultations is when I get asked the question, can I get your designer pricing? I said, you know, it's not what it used to be. You know, the discounts that, you know, there is no such thing as MSRP anymore. There is IMAP pricing and there's advertised pricing online. You have to find the good manufacturers and the vendors. We order direct. I can get you a little bit better than I can online, but I spent hours trying to track down that warranty information. When you order with a rep and you do good business with them, they're like, I will get it there tomorrow. And you have a built-in insurance policy. So really it's about establishing those relationships with a few vendors that you like it's about paying your business the time that it takes to go through that process and then doing your markups and being paid fairly for the business that you're running so you answered my next question okay. <laughs> which is amazing and i'm sure you guys have questions so we'll ask for questions at the end so brian do you charge because you bought into this a little bit just to clarify so the audience understands do you charge a separate project management fee when it comes to procurement how can you estimate hours you talked about that earlier because a lot of people don't know how to estimate hours and then they burn themselves on doing that especially if you're a newer business whereas susan has been doing this for 16 years so she's kind of figured down that figured out that kind of magic mix that equation for her but definitely how do you manage you know the project management fee and how do you estimate your hours so we do the same hourly fee that we would do for design. It, okay. It's the same. Okay. So even if you're purchasing product, you're charging. It's the same. Okay. Uh, as far as calculating hours, uh, we break it down by room. It's in the contract that uh, we feel like the living room will take 20 hours. Ooh, it's a little low, but just say let's, it's 20 hours. And there's a there's a clause in the contract that says that it may go over, it may go over 20, I think it's up to 20%. However, there's another clause that says, if we have gone over the amount of hours or beyond the 20%, we will sit down and recalculate how many more hours we think we need. So we don't get stuck in uh, this is it. Um, because you, you can really screw yourself in that way. But I feel like with seven years experience running my own business, it's easier to calculate the hours, and we usually come out right, right there. I think we have it down to the science. Experience, you found your magic. Yeah, as well. and in the in the beginning, I didn't do that. In the beginning, it was just kind of a willy nilly. Let's start your project. We charge fifty dollars an hour. <laughs> you know, I thought I was rich, um, and and it, it, you know, I did. Clients would get upset because things would take a long time and uh, it went over what their expectation was. So now with the contract, we set, set the expectation of how many hours it's going to take or how many we think it's going to take. Okay, that makes sense. And Susan, you kind of answered our question, but just to clarify that, just can you break that down really quickly on us? Your design, how you manage the billing at the beginning and then at the middle, because I know you have yeah. 10%. So, so I did it a little different, and the reason I did it is, again, like a design fee, that's my ideas. That's the curation of what we've learned over the years. So I'm gonna charge you that flat rate, but I don't wanna get stuck with that client that can't make up their mind, and we've all had the hand-holding client that needs like a million different revisions. 
And luckily that's a very small percentage. Most of the time, if we've done our homework in the beginning, you know, we can hit it in that, in that first, you know, chunk. Um, but we have that in there as a safety. And I even explain that on my phone consults before I even meet with a client. Like the reason that hourly is there is really because some people can make a decision in an hour and other people might need just a little bit more time. And that's just our time to walk you through those different steps and those different options. Um, the reason I did the 10% was I have junior designers that are salaried and I needed to cover overhead on a bigger level. And I didn't, I'm lazy inherently, okay? And so I didn't really want to have to calculate their hours. And I didn't want a client coming back and going, really, it took you an hour to order that one sideboard? Um, and I didn't want to have to bill them separately. And so as a matter of simplification, I went to a flat fee similar to what I do in our general contracting, which is more. But for furniture, I went to a flat fee, figuring that on the whole, when you look at the bulk of the sales, if I have a $50,000 sale and I'm charging 10%, I'm charging $5,000, you better get all that stuff ordered for, I almost swore right here. <laughs> you better get all that stuff ordered for $5,000. And then for that project that maybe we charge that 10%, that it's taking more time because we have a customer service issue or something, a, a deficiency we have to resolve, that, okay, we'd make it up in the next one that was super easy. And so I didn't want, with the vendors that I use, I didn't want to charge a client hourly because our vendor messed up. And I didn't feel like it was fair because it's on me to be efficient with our time and to pick vendors that I knew weren't going to mess up. And so when we were charging hourly for like deliveries and I would show up at an installation and my movers would be two hours late and I'd be sitting there and I'm like, I can't bill my client for this two hours. I picked those movers and they're late and they owe me money, not my client for sitting here. And so when I'm setting up their furniture and the design part is done, I felt weird charging a design fee when I already designed. So I wanted to keep the design fee to, this is my design, I designed it all. Now we're just taking delivery of it and I'm putting it where I told you I was gonna put it because I gave you a cat layout that said this is where I'm gonna put it. So I chose to do it differently and then part of our sales is, listen, you pay it 10% and I will be there the day of install and I will make sure that that furniture is placed where it needs to be. Now if we're accessorizing and coming in with a lot of the pretty stuff after, I will bill them hourly for that and I will go in and accessorize, and that is my design time. But to just put the sofa there where they already know it's supposed to be there, I didn't feel right charging them $200 an hour to like tell the mover to put it there. So that's why I went to the flat fee, and that helps cover all of my administrative and overhead and everything on hold if we hit our numbers each quarter. So. And that leads me into my next question, which I don't know if you're just starting out or you're at this place where you need to pivot your business and figure out what's my next step. You know, how did you get to this point where you knew you were ready to make, what did it take, you know? How many years did you do it one way where you're like, oh crap, I'm doing this wrong, I need to fix my system. And um, what are the actionable steps that you can tell us that to do to make sure that we're not burning ourselves on money and that we're making these decisions at the right point in our business? Well, I think for us, it's really tracking our, our hourly and making sure that we get paid for it. That's our number one. Um, systems that we have in place, we kind of talked about earlier, we need them. I'm gonna lean on you. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm a rebel, I'm a kind of anti-systems person. I always have been. Uh, but as the team grows, I'm seeing that we need them and uh, we're making that change this year. Um, no, it was just pivoting your business. Like, when did you know? Oh, I, I knew when I couldn't do all of the work myself, it was time to change. And when I brought on my first person and saw that uh, she was kind of struggling, I was like, okay, we need somebody else. Um, and I'm not really in the office as much as I used to be. Uh, and I was trying to avoid all my paperwork in the office because I was using numbers to create my spreadsheets, my billable time, oh. etc., And that's how I found you guys. And it was love at first sight. It was love at first sight. And <laughs> honestly, you guys, my life, I mean, 
This is more systems than I had ever had before, and it's so easy. It, I feel like that's my system, so I have like I'm starting to pivot towards other things, but it's been a game changer for sure. And Susan, how did you know when it was time to pivot your business, or have you just kept pivoting your business through the years? A, a mortgage. <laughs> Susan, how did you know when it was time to pivot your business? Um, was pretty part-time until about 2007. Um, my husband left corporate America to kind of, we decided to flip some houses. And then in 2009, with the market crash, we got really scared because we had five little kids. And so we got out and it was that pivotal moment where, what are we gonna do? Or is he gonna go back or are we gonna grow up? My business at that point had a lot of demand, but I could do that and be a stay-at-home mom. So we really made the leap to for me to go full time and I haven't really looked back. We've had a tremendous growing pains. I didn't have anybody like helping me along. I learned by doing and um, I'm a huge proponent in change. If something's not working, you have to fix it. And I would say we hit kind of critical mass about two and a half years ago where we made some big changes um, in what we were doing, and um, you know, I, I I've made every probably every mistake. Like, ask me, like, this is happening. I'll go, yeah, I did that. You know, I I'm sure I made the mistake, and I have burnt people out, and I have backtracked and paid overpaid people and underpaid people. I have you know expected too much of them. I've expected too little. I've uh, run the gamut, and so. I feel like now um, we're over that hump over the last two years, I think, and we're in a really good moving forward trajectory. And so um, our pivot has really been, um, you know, every day I'm always, my mind is always going, what can we do better? What can we do different? What, how can we streamline this? How can we make this easier? And I'm very quickly, I, it doesn't take me a long time to change. I, I can, but not change just to change, but change because it's gonna have an impact. So I don't wanna be that person that, you know, like the wind blows and I'm like, oh, now I'm gonna do this, oh, no, no. It's very methodic and it's very thought out and I stay with it, I'm very loyal to a system until I, I've tried every possible way to make it work and when it doesn't, then I'm ready to let it go and try something different. And so now I feel like we're, we're there. That makes sense. And I know your mind is always working because you text me at 5.55 a.m. And that works when I'm on East Coast hours. But I actually have one more question for you. So yeah. you might want to pass the mic back just a okay. bit. So this is really interesting. And I found it very interesting as I've learned so much from you and about your business over the last year and a half. Since you specialize in construction, can you offer some tips of best practices to our designers in the audience who have to work on the relationship with their contractor? Because it can either be an amazing relationship and you found your guy and that's the contractor and you've created this magic team, or it can be a not so great relationship. So just tell us a little bit about your process and how you kind of well, mitigate it. Okay, um, I'm trying to relate this in designer that would work for you guys. Um, so we got our general contractor's license because I got tired of relying on other people to herd the cats, okay? Um, I, they, they couldn't do it the way that I wanted it done. It wasn't consistent. I was working with different contractors. There were attitudes, there was arrogance, there was, I'll do it my way. And, and I found that the client ultimately suffered um, because again, they, there was no system, there was no protocol and they weren't prepared. And I really hated the fire drills of the night before when the contractor would call and say, where's the tile? You know, and I'm like, I asked you how much I was supposed to order like three weeks ago and you never, you know, told me. And then it's not there or they need it that day or whatever. So I knew I needed to control that process more. Um, as a designer, when you're not a general contractor, I think starting to develop relationships with subcontractors in your area that you trust that are good and keep using them and be loyal and have their back as much as you have your client back. You are Switzerland, right? You are there to advocate for your client, but you're also there to advocate for your contractor because like it or not, contractors get blamed for a lot of things that aren't their fault because somebody's kind of cranky. And so you have to have their back as well and try to stay neutral and figure out where the truth is. It's like children, really. It's like, you know, no, she did. 
And, and Susan has okay. five yeah. five girls. So you have to go, okay, so what did you do? Okay, so what did you do? Okay, so here's how we're gonna fix it and move forward. And it, it really is establishing the relationships though, and, and if you continue to bring them work, they will work hard for you. If you continue to be a source of work, they will work hard for you. Um, when you explain to your clients that, listen, I, you know, I'm at a point right now where we only use our team of subs. I don't work with other contractors. I don't bring other contractors in. This is it. And they're competitive and they're good and they're a curated team and they all know each other, which was super important for me because, you know, when you're in a bathroom remodel and there's just a little bit of baseboard that needs to go in and your baseboard guy is on another job and you want your you know, woodworker guy to throw a piece of base in there, he'll do it because he knows you and he knows the team. Um, you know, you're there as a vehicle to make your client's process easier. So working with a general contractor, if you find one that you really like and that you work well together, hold on to them. Um, if they're honest and loyal, hold on to them. Offer to make their lives easier and charge a project management fee for doing that charge your client. Your client will possibly be double paying, but you are a luxury service. And so if they're paying a general contractor 15% and you're gonna be managing the tile schedules and the fixture schedules and all of those sort of things, explain to your client that, listen, I'm gonna keep this GC on task as much as I possibly can, and this is what I'm gonna ask of them and have a conversation with that general contractor and get on their good side. They view designers as kind of like a I want you, but stay away, right? Like, I want you when I want you, and then I want you to go away and let me do my job. So be nice, be respectful. Don't come in with an attitude, and, and at the same time, if they have an attitude, call them on it. I mean, I won't work with anybody who yells at me. I won't work with anybody who's demeaning or in name calls or anything like that. Like, I'm done. Uh, because there's no room for that. Life is short. This should be fun. The process should be streamlined. Get your processes in place and how you want to work with your contractor and set a system and even have something that the two of you go to coffee and, and you know, do. Like, I need these things from you. You know, a, a week before you need the tile actually there, I need to know how much you need. You know, I need to know this, I need to know that. I will give you all of the information. I am here to make your job easier. So work in tandem with them. No, it's a great answer. Uh, Brian, have you found your contractor, your builder that you work with? Have you put together a team? I personally have put together a team and I found that that's what worked, but I feel like it's a really big pain point for designers. Yeah, actually this year we found someone uh, that is just phenomenal, gets things done on time. We, we really ran into pitfalls with, you know, going with clients, contractors, and having to work with those different personalities, having to work with someone that just bid super cheap, so they got the job, and then you have to deal with all their idiosyncrasies, and they're not getting stuff done on time, and then you have your client coming to you saying, hey, why isn't this done? Well, I'm sorry, but you hired the general contractor. We gave them all the information that you need to achieve the job, you know, and then we're kind of, we're stuck. So this year we found this guy that's just phenomenal. He's, his name's Mike Richmond. If anyone wants to meet him and know him, he's just phenomenal. Gets Sharing things. your content, your information. What, everybody's gonna call him and hire him. I know, then I won't be able to guy. use him. But uh, he's just bends over backwards to make us happy and does phenomenal work and has great uh, subs. So we found someone finally, but it took seven years, you know? So it's a process. Okay, and you both kind of already answered this, but just to reiterate how, like if you're looking at your business now versus looking at your business five, six years ago, how has technology changed the way that you manage your business for the better and helped you take that business, your business to the next level? Gosh, I mean, everything's so fast now. Before it was a lot of, uh, a lot of filling in spreadsheets, a lot of uh, duplicating work, a lot of, doing a timesheet and then taking that the final number from the timesheet and putting it in an invoice and in numbers or Excel, whatever you use. And now it's just like, bam, it happens. You track your time, you can bill it. Uh, also, just getting products off of line, offline and uh, being able to create your proposal, your invoice, and your PO, and it just automatically sends. 
has saved so much of time for us. Susan, what about you? Before, I don't know this story, before Big Camp and I mean, what were you using and kind of how has that led or helped you grow your team? And uh, well, we were using Studio Woodware where I wanted to put my ads on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Too much. Got it. Uh, funny story about that is that I had six employees at the time using it, and our bookkeeper told us that all of our employees had to get out of the software because they were making too many errors, and they couldn't be in it, and they wanted us to hire them just to do all of our input. And I'm like, any software that kicks our designers out, I can't. That was the that was the straw that broke the camel's back, as they say. It was just too complicated to teach. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm back in the old age where we used to have paper files. And so now we are completely paperless. I don't print, you know, we print very little other than maybe we'll print out our estimates at a presentation or print out tear sheets. But we do virtually everything either in Basecamp and Ivy, so there's really no paper, um, and everything is cloud-based. So um, those two systems are probably streamlined. And then again, I'm, I am a systems geek. I am, you know, I wasn't always because it was just me, and I could kind of make it up on the fly. Um, but once you start having employees and you start looking at it as a business and you start looking at the charts and graphs and things your husband sends you and you're like, oh shit, I gotta, like, I, I gotta, like, I gotta buck up here. Like, I gotta make this, you know, um, a, a, an actual, like, really look at it hard. And so the reporting and all of that stuff is super important to us with IV, all the reports. Look at your numbers, even if you don't want to. So that actually leads me to our final question. Give us your short list. What are your steps to running a profitable business? If you had to list out a couple things and give our audience some advice, what would you say, Ryan? Okay, so my number one is be nice. Okay. Be nice. <laughs> be nice to your clients, be nice to your vendors, be nice to yourselves. That's my number one. Uh, number two, be honest. If you make a mistake, I'm up to it. Uh, it goes a lot further. Pick up the phone to let them know you made a mistake. Um, what other success things? Uh, make time for yourself. I think that's a huge one. You touched on that earlier. But if you neglect other parts of your life, your marriage, your uh, fitness, whatever it is, whatever gets you going, uh, other things will suffer because of it. So I think that uh, is a huge one that I was missing in the very beginning. What about you, Susan? Um, I think I would be, I would say, gosh, uh, get branded. Um, branding is something that's often overlooked when you're a younger, newer designer. Get a good logo, get a good company culture, start thinking about your mission statement, what it is that you want to do. Um, really have a professional appearance. Have even like the old thing, you know, fake it till you make it, right? Put it out there that you are a professional and you've thought about your business. Um, number two, I think, is look at your numbers. What do you need to make to keep your doors open? What do you have to do each day to pay your bills? If you're doing this as a source of income, it might be when I started, I was fortunate enough, my husband had a full time job and this was for like fun. I, it was my fun job. And now it supports our family and kids in college and everything. So it's really gone. I've seen all facets of it. And so if you're really serious about being in business, I think you really got to look long and hard at your numbers. What do I need to make a year? What do, how many hours can I work? How many can I dedicate? The third, I would say, educate yourself as much as possible. So go out, read everything you can, ask questions, use your reps. I always tell my newer designers, you don't, I don't expect you to know everything about interior design because school probably didn't teach you a whole lot about everyday design life. But what you do have at your fingertips is Google, product reps, showrooms, um, Risa, all these people that you can go to and ask the question. When I take a client to a flooring showroom, stuff changes all the time. You cannot be expected to know everything about everything. You need to know three things about each product, about your flooring. What's your flooring? Is it oak? Is it hickory? Is it what, what's the hardness scale? What's this? What's the color? What's the stain? Ask the questions of your rep. Take your team or go with a colleague to a showroom and ask them to give you a tour. Ask them to teach you about the product. 
half of interior design, I think, is sales, and half is actually knowing how to design. You have to know how to design, right? You have to have a scale and aesthetics, and you have to have kind of that skill set. But a lot of it is sales because you're trying to get somebody to trust you with thousands of dollars of their money to buy things on their behalf, and they want to look at you as the expert. So be the expert. Go and learn about your product and know those things when you're talking to a client. Um, so that they know that you have an understanding, or if you don't, you know, I don't know, but I'm gonna talk to my rep, and my reps are great, and they know everything about this. So I would say, use your reps. Um, offload a lot of your work to your reps. Ask them questions, give the information to your client, be that go-between and that advocate. Um, know your numbers, I already said that. What else? Uh, branded, I agree with the whole be nice. I'm mostly nice, <laughs> like 80%. <laughs> um, sometimes I'm not. Um, communicate, you know, keep that door of uh, communication open with your client. Um, hustle, just get out and hustle. Talk to people, network, go out, get involved in your schools, get involved in nonprofits, get involved in um, networking areas if you're trying to grow your business because that will grow your, that face time will grow your business. Um, and, um, you know, donate your time to, uh, you know, a school foundation, you know, throw in a consultation or something to get your name out there and to get out there and, and growing. Um, but get your systems in place, which is a big, big piece of it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Susan and Brian. And before we wrap up, I just want to open this up to any questions in the audience. Does anybody have any questions for Susan? Anything you've ever dreamed up? This is your chance now? Yes. You're not the yeah. You mentioned you mark up the interior finishes 10%, and then you said the contract was different. What is the difference? Uh, no, so because we're designing, so typical general contractors, it seems industry standard is somewhere around 13% overhead, 13 profit, so about 26% maybe as a general. Um, what we do is a little bit different. We're at about 15% because we mark up our labor and we mark up our product. So our margin comes out about 30% overall. So where do you, where do you draw the line between what the interior design mark up and what the um, You can't really mark up labor without and stay competitive if you mark it up. Like a, a, a lamp, I can mark up at a 2.0, right? I can buy it for 100 and sell it for 200. Um, you can't do that with a plumbing fixture. There's just not that much margin in materials. So you maybe will get 8 to 10% maybe on plumbing or on tile, maybe 10% stay competitive on labor. You know, the end is, there's industry standards of what tile installers will, will charge or carpet installers will charge. So. You really get a much lower percentage markup versus furniture, but you're dealing with more volume. So if I'm marking carpet up a dollar a foot and I've got 2,000 square feet of carpet, I just made $2,000. But if I give them my cost and only charge 26%, I'm not making that same margin at the end of the day that we're trying to hit to keep our doors open. So it really depends on. Uh, the product with construction, there's more volume. You're you're selling a lot more stuff. You know your project budgets are higher. You know in the hundred hundred fifty thousand dollar range. So when you're selling stuff and you charge fifteen percent on that, it felt fair because we're involved from the beginning. I don't have to spend the time telling the contractor how I want the tile installed. I've been working with my tile installer before I was a designer for eighteen years. He knows how I like that for done on that shower. He knows what grout color I'm going to pick. So my value add to my client is, listen, I've been, I, I have a team and I'm doing this. And so since we're doing the whole design portion and we're ordering all the materials for you and we're doing all of the project management, we just not discount it, but we do a 15% because I feel like that's fair. Who else? Okay. If you just say your question, I can repeat it so everybody can hear you. My name is Debbie, and I'm actually a marketer. Two of my major clients are interior designers. And one of the things that I help them do is navigate their growth. Um, from, like you said, Susan, you started off as kind of, it was a hobby, and now it, it's putting your kids through college. And so I was wondering if you could um, just share are there, are there any like major points along the way where you stop at that point and you're like, oh my God, all right, what direction am I going to go in now? And what were those? 
what were those pivots? What happened in your company that mortgage? <laughs> well, yeah, it was the boat was one um, helped Susan pivot in her business. Just so you guys know. Yeah, um, I think it was, you know, I hate to say this because I do love design, but I kind of like the business side as much as I do, if not a little bit more than the design even. I like the business side. It was exciting to me uh, because I have a psychology degree, okay? So I really thought, that, you know, unless I got my master's, like I was gonna work at McDonald's, this was it, you know? So not that there's anything wrong with that, but anything, anyway. I think the pivot really for me was trying to see if we could make it work and how to make it work and how I was gonna be profitable. And we went through, like I said earlier, every growing pain you could possibly, I, mean, I made mistakes. Um, and I look back and I go, that, part, that was part of the journey that got us here. Um, and it's not perfect. I don't mean to come off like I have the golden ticket, like I got it figured out because I don't. I am still a work in progress and I will always be because I think there's always room to improve. But I think that it was looking at the numbers, where I wanted to be, how I wanted to do better, and then I was fortunate enough that our business is really referral driven. And so I had been established enough, and I had, I really carry, you know, and I, I'm, I am a big house user. I use my rep. So I call my rep and say, go keyword my photos. And I'm not in the house hysteria, and I'm not a part of that because I use them to promote my business, and I curate all of my reviews on house and I go to my clients right after and I want that positive review and I want people to read about what their experiences are and I chose that platform because you should have two or three different social media platforms that you focus on. You cannot be on all the different social media platforms and be successful. You have to pick like three that you can be and so I picked you know Facebook where all my mom friends are in my network and then I picked you know Instagram where all the Call it like the design culture is that want to repost you and you know they see you on there too and then I picked towels because it was a platform that aligned with what I was trying to do from an interior design standpoint and I worked really hard to get to that number one spot in San Diego by doing my projects uploading my photos getting my reviews having my stuff keyworded answering the questions doing all of the things um, and organically I'm there I don't pay for that I, I am organically there now, but because I worked at it and hustled. So as far as pivoting, I would say financially motivated. I wanted a lifestyle. I take summers off with my kids. I hike them out of town for eight weeks and I work remotely and I wanted that lifestyle. And I have a kind of a joke hashtag that's practicing retirement, but that's really what I'm trying to build is a place where I can get to where I have a lifestyle. I don't need to be I'm wealthy in different ways. I don't need to be uber, like top echelon person. I just want to be, live my life and have a lifestyle that's comfortable and, and suits me. So it may not be for everyone because everybody's different. Everybody's going to run their business differently. So. Thank you, Susan. What other questions do we have? Anybody? Any questions? No. Okay, make sure I'm not missing anybody. Oh, I see. Yes. Best strategies for marketing. Oh, it's Susan. It's like best strategies for marketing when you first are starting out. This is a great topic we talked about on Tuesday. I think there's a lot of different strategies, and not one of them is better than the other. Um, I've heard, like when I first started, my value proposition was a very low hourly rate, working for friends and family, passing along all my discounts because I viewed my value to a client since I didn't have experience is what I could buy them for a discount. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of new designers make is, oh, I can get you that discount, do you wanna hire me? You know, like, I can get that for you at Cox, do you wanna hire me? Um, and I think that it devalues the skill set that you're bringing to the job, that even though you're new, I would almost rely on a mentor or touch base with a mentor or something where you can mentor through a project um, and kind of not let on that you don't have the experience, but kind of start to build that clientele and just have a couple successful projects. 
I think when you're first starting out on social media, there's a lot you can do now with mood boards and putting different, you know, social media marketing with here's a mood board of a room or here's what I designed for this or here's give the illusion that you're designing these spaces, but maybe they're just kind of your concepts of what you're putting together so people see what you can put together. Um, I think there's a huge untapped market, again, in the school foundations in our community. They, having served on the board of foundations for years in my kids' schools, they will do anything for an auction item. I mean, they will, like, beat down your door. And if you put a cute pillow from Home Goods and a couple picture frames together in a cute basket with an interior design console, and you do 10 of those, um, that's the soft cost. That's just your time. And as you're growing, that's how you're going to start getting that referral base. And then when you tell that client, oh, hey, if you refer me, I'll give you an hour of free time, and I'll come back and do X, Y, and Z for you, then you're incentivizing that client, you're bringing them value and the new client value. And so, you know, I wouldn't discount. Um, I would charge for your time, but I would bring, say, okay, it's, um, you know, my console is $100, and if you buy a console, I will bring that you get a free gift. I'm going to bring a book, but I would discount it because somebody's asked you to discount it. Um, don't devalue what you're doing. But I would say network, get out there, um, work for a couple friends for free, and for the portfolio photos. Talk to your friends. If you have a budget, you have a project you want to do, I will work for free. Give me the photos. Let me get it out there. And then start to work the social media. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, how it's, you, it, how did I get it? How did you build your Instagram followers? So, um, just repeating the question for, the, for Brian, how did he build his Instagram following? So, uh, I started my Instagram about seven years ago, and uh, five years ago. And in the beginning, it was really easy because the algorithm was very different than it is today. So, today it's harder to get more Instagram followers. Um, I just put work on there that I feel looks great. I don't, I, I put a little personal in there too. Um, so I feel like people have a connection with me and they want to follow. Um, we were actually talking about this before the panel. Sometimes if you do too much personal, people will start to unfollow you. I have an app that tells me how many people have started following me, how many people have deleted me, whatever. Um, so I, I keep track of what photos are doing well, what are not, and I post more that are doing well. And sometimes, like you said, posting uh, mood boards or whatever, if I have nothing to post, I find something I like, and I'll post it, and I give credit to the person that took the picture or designed the space or whatever. Properly crediting everybody involved. Yes, you have to, because it, it, it can get kind of hairy. Um, but, What's her name? Stark? Oh, what's her name? There's a, a gosh, I can't think of her name. Oh, Ashley Stark. Stark. Yeah, yeah. She has, I don't know, over 500,000 followers. Not one of her pictures is her own. So she credits everybody, but she just posts amazing stuff. So if you have nothing of your own to post, say, hey, this is my design inspiration for the day. Yeah, one more question. Go for it. Do you think social media is more important than a website? Do you think, this is so interesting, do you think social media is more important than a website? Brian, go for it. No. You have to have a great website because honestly, the people that are following on Instagram usually are not potential clients. It's younger people. It's people that want to see cool things and none of my clients are on Instagram. Zero. Uh, but they do go to my website, and that's where I think you should spend most of your time and energy on your website. I mean, well, you can get it going and then go from there. You don't have to update it all the time. What about you, Susan? No, I want to answer this. This is a good one. Um, okay, so I only know this because my oldest daughter is a website and branding um, person and did all of our branding and our nonprofit branding and everything and graphic designer. So the way she explains it is you... Basically, everything is interactive. You still have to have a really strong website, like you said, but everything should link and hyperlink to everything else. It should all play together. 
So you should have links to your, your Instagram feed should be on your website as a you know add-on plugin. Your links to some of our pictures go to our house portfolio, to our reviews. Our review link goes here, our Facebook link goes there. The, they, your blog should be pinned to Pinterest. Like all of it is interactive and they all play together. And when you pick your platforms, you need to, to have them all kind of weave together. Uh, to get the most traction of, of what you want because your picture is like who cares if somebody sees your picture in Connecticut? Well, sometimes that picture in Connecticut might circulate around Pinterest and then somebody in San Diego sees that picture and clicks on it and goes, oh wow, we're here locally, you know, so it all is interactive and plays together and it will drive traffic to your website. So Pinterest drives traffic to your website. Instagram feeds traffic there. Facebook feeds traffic there. So you still need to have that one place that kind of collates it, but you don't have to spend a lot of time continually updating it. If you have a strong website, you can use those other platforms to augment it because they're clicking away and coming back and going through your website and things like that. So it's all part of your branding package, basically. So this, that, this is a whole separate conversation and we can have round two of this panel or you can come up and ask Brian and Susan questions. Um, definitely want to give you guys some time to mix and mingle and chat and meet each other and introduce yourself. You guys are all in the same location. Yeah. Can I just give a plug really quick for the second beginning? Yeah. Oh, and I was gonna do this, but go ahead. And there's something really amazing happening on September 8th. September 8th, so we started this nonprofit four years ago and we make over kids' rooms that are facing a medical crisis. Most often cancer, but not always. We had a 16-year-old up in Pearl Mountain that was in a car accident last October and was paralyzed we remodeled his downstairs and we are all community volunteer driven uh, grassroots um, you know raise money any money that we raise here in san diego stays in san diego and as you heard early on in 2018 uh, from a aside from my business we decided to pivot and open national chapters and so house sponsored five of our seven chapters that we opened this year and then have committed to sponsoring another five next year um, to open more chapters to help more kids and they're all designer driven um, but we have our fundraiser in um, September 8th at the Omni La Costa and I'll be and there and Brian will be there and Susan will be there so you there. and um, if any of you are flipping out fans from Bravo Jeff Lewis is our keynote speaker that night um, which is exciting for me because I kind of feel like he might be my brother. <laughs> Maybe, just because we're a little similar, sort of, but I'm not quite as, as caustic. But anyway, um, I adore him and I'm looking forward to having him there. And uh, it's going to be a really good event. We have a couple of our kids speaking. We've got a full dinner menu, wine, a gin bar, um, a live artist. We've got live music. It's going to be a really fun event. So if you guys can make it, we'd love to have you guys attend. And the postcards are all on your little seats, and the website's there, and you can click on there and find the tickets. So, yep. so definitely introduce yourself to one another. If you want to ask questions for Susan and Brian, come jump up here, ask some questions. If you have questions about Ivy, um, you can ask Amanda or Lisa any questions. They're in the white hat, and we're really excited to have you guys here. Thank you. And don't forget your swag bags. There's a fun stuff. Thank you.